Center. <coughs> Excuse me. I wanted to thank the great team um, at DSLBD and InnoEd. You know, this is a this is a scary topic, um, but it's a topic that we knew we wanted to hit head on because, you know, as we are reopening and and um, and the the bans on evictions are being lifted, we wanted to make sure that people understood. You know, the rules and the, the rules of engagement. And so, you know, one of the things or the promises that I feel like DSLBD is making to the small business community is to get as much information out there as expeditiously as possible and, and, you know, and not to shrink away from tough topics. And so this is one of them. So I want to again just say, I'm glad that people are here so that they are informed. Um, you know, the more you know, the better you can advocate for yourself. Um, and and thank you to our partners for helping keep our small businesses informed because these are uh, these are important topics that we all can make sure that we can advocate and and make sure that we're staying on the best path possible. So, you know, sharpen your pencils and listen up. We've got some really smart people that can help you, and um, and hopefully get everybody a little smarter than when they started. So, thank you very much, and. Um, and I will not distract anymore from the uh, from the agenda. Thanks for the time. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Director. 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 My apologies. Is my video still doing that? It is not. Okay, great. Um, for those of you who had just joined us um, a, a minute or so after the hour, that was DSLBD Director Christy Whitfield welcoming everyone and thanking our speakers. I'm going to just quickly introduce them and turn things over. Once again, we have Dan Kaufman from the Veritas Law Firm and Christine Kulamani from the DC Bar Pro Bono Center for this important session. Hi, everybody. This is Christine from the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. Uh, the Pro Bono Center is a nonprofit organization that provides pro bono free legal services to individuals, nonprofits, and small businesses in the DC area. I work in our nonprofit and small business legal assistance program, um, and I see many familiar faces and names and some new ones. The Pro Bono Center is a resource where we provide information, written materials, webinars, podcasts, as well as free one on one legal advice. And we'll talk about how you can access that information once we get towards the end of the presentation. Um, so. As director Whitfield mentioned, there's a lot of tensions and concerns for small businesses, commercial tenants who are not running their business out of their home, but rent a storefront a restaurant, another space. And what does the process of going forward look like? You may have racked up $100,000 in rent after 15 months, trying to figure out what are the next steps? What are the rules of engagement? And so to set a little bit of the landscape, when most of us think of landlord tenant and tenant rights, we think about residential tenants. If you're renting an apartment in the district, many folks are familiar with your right to stay. Um, that maybe you go on a rent strike if the space isn't maintained properly. Rent control, late fee limitations. Oh, if something is broken, maybe you don't have to pay your rent, but definitely your landlord will have to fix it. There are limits on security deposits. And overall, the views are, you know, the laws are viewed to be very strongly in favor of tenants. All of this applies exclusively to residential tenants. When you think about your business, commercial tenancies, forget what you know about an apartment and start with a clean slate. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dan Kaufman. Um, as Kate mentioned, an attorney at Veritas Law, also a longtime amazing volunteer with the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, and we can just get right into it. Um, and we will have time for questions at the end. Um, just a, a word of advice on that. As you think through potential questions you may want to ask, keep in mind, try to keep them 
general rather than specific one because um, in this limited webinar, we probably won't be able to help very much with a specific question. And two, it, it's going to help more people if you ask a broad general question that uh, could apply to multiple tenants. Um, let's talk about basic te uh, commercial tenant rights. So, um, a tenancy is typically via a, a written lease, and a written lease is a contract. So, think of you know a commercial tenancy as a creature of contract. So, the, the terms and conditions there are as agreed upon by the landlord and tenant. Um, within a commercial lease, you know, it, it may you know, specify that uh, certain rights are waived. This is very typical. So uh, the right to jury trial often waive the, the right to re receive notice before the landlord can terminate the lease and proceed to trying to take back the property. That may also be in there. So, um, what may or may not be in there is whether or not you need to receive uh, a notice and cure period uh, prior to you being in true default to your lease. And that that's just going to be a specific case by case situation. But um, typically within commercial tenant lease, it will specify um, either you need to receive notice and cure for your particular violation, whether that's monetary, i.e., the payment of rent, or non monetary some other provision of a lease that doesn't relate to paying rent. And then otherwise, um, certain rights may be uh, waived in there. Um, next thing, self-help eviction. So I talked about um, you may be waiving certain rights and the landlord may be able to terminate the lease and move towards trying to evict you. However, the landlord can't do so unilaterally, they have to go through a process um, that means going through DC uh, Superior Court and Landlord Tenant Court within there. Um, they have to get a judgment for possession and then they have to involve uh, the US Marshal's office. So things like changing the locks, turning off utilities, um, putting up some other sort of barrier to prevent access, that also that all has to be done via a process and they cannot do so unilaterally. They're, uh, I, I know of many instances or anecdotes of landlords attempting to do this, but at the end of the day, they, they still have to go through a process in order for a tenancy to be uh, extinguished in any form. Um, if the landlord tries to do this without uh, going through the proper channels, um, they risk great penalty and they don't effectively uh, extinguish the tenancy. They're just um, allowing you, the tenant, to be able to uh, ignore the landlord's um, actions at that point and kind of come right back in. So, for example, if the landlord uh, changed the locks without having gone to court, um, I've seen tenants do this. They could just go right back in, hire their own locksmith, um, change the locks back, and keep operating. And that is legal for the tenant to do. Their tenancy is still in place. They cannot be legally evicted that way. So that's just something uh, to keep in mind. As Dan, to, yep, Christine, if a ahead. landlord is threatening a self-help eviction, mm -hmm. what are the options, right? Before we get to the locks are actually changed and we're calling a locksmith. Is there anything specific that they can say to their landlord other sure. than this is illegal? Um, yeah, so this is a great question. It's come up many times. It, it's probably going to be dependent on the circumstances and what uh, may particularly work with your landlord. Um, you know, a sophisticated landlord that has legal representation um, is different than uh, what I term an unsophisticated landlord that is kind of doing this all on their own. I think a landlord with legal representation, if you could um, send a written notice to either the landlord or their representation and say, um, hey, what you're threatening to do is illegal for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, if you pursue this route, not only will you not extinguish the tenancy, but you will be opening yourself up to potential damages from the tenant. You know, if the landlord goes in, changes the locks, causes you to not be able to operate your business for a period of time uh, because of it, that um, that can fall on the landlord. And, you know, if any... Uh, 
council that they have should should realize that and we'll probably be advising them not to further act upon it if they're not represented by council it gets a little trickier because um you know you need to certainly get through to them you could still send them a letter saying x y and z the law is clear on this but um, that may not help i mean the the clearest way to stop them would be to get an injunction um, or a temporary restraining order from uh, DC Superior Court uh, and joining them from doing so. Uh, ideally, you wouldn't have to go through those steps to, in effect, have to get a court order, which if they violated, then you could clearly show uh, they're in violation of. But that that is a, a clear way to attempt to get them to stop doing that. Uh, I mean, to get the court order, the landlord would have probably had to have done something that you could then use to get the TRO, whether it's, you know, an email or a letter notifying you, it'd be harder if it was just oral in nature, but you could certainly try um, and present evidence on that fact as well. So that's a long way of saying there's not a uh, clear right answer in every situation, but the injunction TRO is a certainty as to how to get a legal barrier to the landlord. But again, they could flout that as well. Um, just like they they're flouting the law by trying to do self-help evictions in the first place, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, look to your lease um, for any additional rights, duties, and obligations, and um, the wonderful slides that you see pro bono centers put together here list a number of them, you know, option renew maintenance repairs, uh, rent increases, late fees, assignment, uh, waiver, right to jury trial, early termination, all those things. If you uh, looked at your commercial lease, if you have one, um, those shall be in there. And um, those rights are, as I said before, um, the creature of contract. So for many of them, it's whatever the landlord and tenant have negotiated amongst themselves. There's nothing via statute for the most part that requires a landlord to you know have certain maintenance and repair obligations or only be able to increase your rent per year by a certain percentage usually that's all by contract it can be whatever the parties have agreed to and so there's no uh, specific commercial tenant rights as it relates to those specific provisions so uh next let's talk about the court process for an eviction case so if the landlord has done whatever they're required to do under the lease in order to move towards an eviction, um, you know, presenting you with uh, a notice, an opportunity to cure, if that's within your lease or, or whatever else is in there, then they can move forward with an eviction case. Now, the current state of eviction cases in DC is completely different than it was prior to the pandemic. And it's probably completely different than it'll be uh, a few months from now. So we're kind of in a strange gray area here where for the last you know, 15 or less months, um, we've been in a situation where things have been completely different for both landlords and tenants and their attorneys. And so the process is it's kind of new to everyone and some people are still learning uh, what it all means. So previously, you know, before uh, the spring of 2020, uh, landlord files uh, a complaint in the landlord tenant branch. Tenants usually served uh, with that complaint and then initial hearing day to set um, typically about a month later. Uh, you have the initial hearing date, there may or may not be a mediation uh, as part of that. And then if parties don't come to settlement, then there could be a trial held maybe a month after the initial hearing date. Um, and then, you know, if the landlord wins at the trial, they could receive what's called a judgment for possession, which means they could take back the property. Although, as slides indicate, that doesn't mean the tenant's leaving just yet. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but all in all, this process took two plus months uh, for the most part. So, it was fairly quick um, compared to what we're seeing now. I mean, right now, June 2021, there were cases filed in 
February 2020, which have not been resolved yet. So it really elongated the entire process up until this point. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. All right. And so once the landlord has a judgment for possession, the there also be what's called a writ of restitution um, from the landlord tenant court, which um, is then sent to the US Marshals Service. So right now, just so you understand the way things were and the way things are right now, um, the way things were, that process was pretty quick. Landlord tenant court would send that to the US Marshals Service. And, and then they would so softly, I can't remember what he's saying. And then a, the U.S. Marshal Service would schedule an eviction yeah. Yeah. from there. Um, and then the U.S. Marshal Service would carry out the eviction, and the landlord would have the opportunity to change locks. Um, right now, the landlord tenant court is not sending any writs of restitution on to the U.S. Marshal Service, so the U.S. Marshal Service is not okay. scheduling any evictions. Um, at all uh, right now. Hi, I'm just gonna step in real quick. Wait, if you have your um if you're on, not on mute, if you could mute your line just so that we could hear everyone. Um we are looking through to try to mute everyone's lines. Um but if you could try to stay on mute that would be very helpful. Thank you so much. So going back so right now if um you were trying to schedule uh, in addition to the U.S. Marshal Service, they would just say, can't do anything right now. We're waiting on the emergency legislation to expire um, for both commercial and residential. So nothing's happening from the U.S. Marshal Service at this point, at least as far as I'm, uh, the way I understand it. Um, once the U.S. Marshal Service carries out the eviction and the landlord changes laws, then the tenant has no right to occupy the property after eviction. However, um, Keep in mind that if there is a judgment for possession against you for non-payment of rent, you have the ability to what's called redeem uh, that judgment at any point up until the point that the U.S. Marshal Service executes the eviction. So, um, anytime up now till that point, if you owe a hundred thousand dollars and all of a sudden you come up with it the morning of the eviction, you can stop the eviction. Um, so keep that in mind. That is the point. Of no return, basically. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so if we're not talking about eviction, then a a landlord could bring a civil case against either the tenant or perhaps the guarantors in DC Superior Court or Small Claims Court. It's a but it's a civil action, so it's not out. It's outside of the landlord tenant branch of the superior court um, those cases are different than landlord tenant court they are if you've ever um, had jury duty for a civil case or you've never dealt with a civil case in another way it, it's typical civil procedures so um, tenants serve with a complaint um, tenant has to file an answer then there's initial hearing date and there there could be motions filed, there could be discovery uh, before trial. So the typical, what people think of as a, a civil case and trial, that that's what happens in those instances. And then if the landlord wins there, then get a judgment for money damages of the amount due under the lease, either against the tenant or the guarantors or both. So Dan? Yeah. If there's a guarantor, mm -hmm. the landlord is able to sue only the guarantor and not the business or the tenant itself. Correct. They can do okay. that. And particularly most guarantee language that I see um, will specifically state that they can do that. Um, if it doesn't specifically state that, you know, the guarantor that's being sued could provide that as a defense um, and that may or may not be successful depending on the circumstances, but 
Um, typically in your standard personal guarantee signed between tenant and guarantor, um, it will say that the landlord has the ability to do that um, without having pursued the tenant uh, for non-payment rent. Okay. And for both and, eviction cases, oh, go ahead. Yep, no, nope, go ahead. So for both eviction cases and collections cases for unpaid rent, yeah. are businesses going to need to hire an attorney or can they take themselves through this process? Got it. So um, general rule of thumb is that if you are a business entity, um, you can't represent yourself. And so typically you're gonna have to hire someone to represent you. If you're a guarantor, a personal guarantor, um, and you're getting sued, for example, for not uh, for the amounts due by the tenant, um, you could represent yourself. Um, in the case, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but yeah, you do have the ability to do so. And can you explain what, uh, very simply, you know, what would consist of a business being a business entity? Does that mean an LLC? Or what? Sure. So <laughs> there, there are a number of different types of business entities in DC. Um, the most popular ones being an LLC or a corporation. Um, there are other forms like uh, partnerships, uh, limited partnerships, uh, limited liability partnerships. Um, but for the most part, when we're talking about business entities, we're talking about corporations. And LLCs, individuals are not considered business entities, but otherwise, any other form, you may fall into that category. Perfect. All right. Um, why don't we go to the next slide on yeah, special COVID nineteen protections in DC? So, um, back in the spring of twenty twenty. The DC Council passed a pretty extensive uh, piece of legislation that put in a number of uh, protections for not just businesses, but also residents in DC, and not just related to leases, but in all forms. Um, but of particular interest to commercial tenants, um, there was a temporary stop to eviction filings. Um, and executing evictions. There is a stop to serving um, in relation to eviction filing. So not only could you not file it, but you can serve during a period of time, or at least that's what the council is going for. Um, no commercial rent increases um, during this period of time. Late fees we'll, we'll get to in relation to the payment plan. Um, so for commercial tenants, unable to pay rent due to the public health emergency, um, landlords were required to offer rent payment plan, which, um, was for no less than a period of 1 year. Um, there are no lump sum payments required and can cover all the unpaid rent due during the, what I'll call the, uh, I think program period is what the statute says. And what exactly that means is up for debate, but it it's at least the amount due um, from the public health emergency. Um, if the landlord hasn't offered a payment plan, or if you have one and you've complied with it, the landlord can't file an eviction or file a collections case in relation to the non-payment of rent. Um, one small note here is that for commercial rent increases, what the statute says it relates to commercial retail tenants or commercial tenants occupying less than 6,500 square feet. So I'm assuming that is most of the people that would be on this webinar, but I'm just noting that if you're not a retail tenant and you have over 6,500 square feet, um, that doesn't apply. And the same thing with the payment plans, it only relates to uh, commercial retail tenants and uh, smaller commercial tenants, i.e. under 6,500 square feet. Um, let's see. So when it comes to 
some of these changes. Yeah. Right? It sounds like we're trying to figure it out. We don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, has been going around and I've had a few people ask is I heard yeah. that the eviction moratorium doesn't mm -hmm. apply to commercial tenants. Is that true? Got it. Um, well, I mean, the, <laughs> the nuanced answer is the coronavirus emergency legislation has a number of protections for residential tenants, some of which, but not all of which also apply to commercial tenants. So uh, not everything in the emergency legislation protects commercial tenants. However, practically speaking right now, commercial tenants are protected by that legislation. One other thing I will note is that throughout this period of time, there, there's been various instances of where there was a commercial uh, filing moratorium on evictions and that was then held unconstitutional. And now that ruling has been stayed on appeal. And so in effect, there is still a moratorium on filing, although people that have filed previously, their lawsuits are probably just pending. Nothing's really happened with them. No in initial hearing dates have been uh, held yet or scheduled. And so there's this, we're in this weird period where um, there was a statute whereby the council tried to halt all uh, eviction filings. That was held by a trial court to be unconstitutional. That was appealed. And during the appeal, the appeals court has said, let's stay this ruling by the trial court. So for now, there's still a, an eviction filing moratorium in place. Um, that those filing moratoriums and the or the provisions on serving the complaints. That doesn't necessarily apply to other parts of eviction proceedings. So, for example, if your if your case was filed in February of 2020, um, it's been held up for a number of reasons um, throughout the months. But there's nothing stopping that case from proceeding through to trial right now. At least that's how the trial court and the landlord tenant court are treating it that they can hold initial hearing dates and they can uh, potentially hold trial dates so that that's kind of the status of things there and it's ever evolving there could be an appeals court decision that affects the decision on the moratorium whether it's unconstitutional that affects things there is as we were saying before things could change very quickly the council previously was considering legislation that would change a lot of the provisions uh, in the emergency legislation and whether or not to change language or end uh, certain provisions moving forward. And so that could happen fairly quickly um, and at which point everything we're talking about, the current state of the law could completely change, frankly, and the speed through which uh, landlord tenant court cases happen could change completely. And so keep that in mind that this is an ever evolving um, area and so things could completely change but we're just trying to give you the lay of the land here uh, as we currently see it it seems like for a lot of the small businesses that have really been struggling to pay rent right now it's gives you know a bit of a peace of mind that they can't be evicted uh, mm -hmm. but they're really focused on this payment plan provision right being required for most of them um, yeah to work with their landlord. Can a landlord put a date on a payment plan that you know of? So for example, send a letter saying, here's your offer of a payment plan. You mm -hmm. have five days to accept right. or reject it. Right. Uh, it's a great question. That um, aspect, as far as I know, has not been, um, I haven't seen it seen any ruling on that specifically as to whether they can do that. I, um, <laughs> just to put on my landlord hat here, if I were representing a landlord, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect the tenant to respond in some way after some reasonable period of time. What that period of time is, I think is debatable. 
um, if the landlord hasn't heard from you in 12 months, could can they take that as you not being interested in the payment plan? I think so. Um, but you know, what that line is, I don't think is clear. Um, and so if the landlord did give you five days, um, if you can respond in, in within the five days, I, I guess I would, but I don't, I don't necessarily think you would be held to that um, in court. I think you can make an argument that look, the land, the landlord just came up with this deadline. There's nothing in the statute requiring it. Um, and therefore tenants should be able to uh, respond and uh, apply for a payment plan uh, after another reasonable period of time, especially if a landlord's asking for certain information that while may not be required by statute, the landlord may have asked for. So if they're asking for additional information from the tenant, I especially think that um, a longer period of time to answer would be required. And uh, that that's just situation specific. I've seen landlords ask for pages and pages of documents, which one, I don't think is actually called for, but if they were to do so and actually expect the tenant to comply, I think there's no way uh, the tenant could do so within five days, for example. So uh, I think it's a great question. I think it's situation specific. Um, if they did five days, I, I don't think the tenant should be um, required to respond in that short period of time, but I haven't seen anything either way from the courts on that. And so more on this payment plan thing, reading the law, it says that the landlord needs to offer a payment plan. Yeah. But there's no mention of negotiation. And right. sometimes what the landlord offers may not be interesting for the tenant, but it also might not be possible, right? Mm -hmm. We're still in the process of slowly reopening. Have you seen, you know, you work with landlords and tenants. So have you seen a willingness to negotiate or has it been kind of, just hope that the tenant accepts the offer and move forward. Right. Um, I, I think there, there's no requirement that the landlord negotiate uh, terms better for the tenant than what's in the statute. Um, so if the landlord's not offering what's required in the statute, I've seen this plenty of times, you know, landlord offers a payment plan that's only six months, for example, instead of 12 months or landlord offers a payment plan uh, that doesn't comply in some other way. It doesn't uh, involve all rent that comes due during the, you know, quote unquote program period. Um, well, then they haven't offered a client payment plan. And then obviously the tenant can respond back and say, landlord, you haven't offered this. Um, how about instead we do X, Y, and Z. Um, as it relates to negotiate, if, if what's being offered doesn't work for the tenant, I think the tenant is free to ask for terms that actually work for them, um, but that if the tenant does so and is in effect rejecting the compliant payment plan offered by the landlord, then arguably the landlord would have the right after that rejection to um, say, we complied with the statute, we can move forward with an eviction case because the tenant's rejected. So, you know, if you're a tenant and it doesn't work for you, I understand that. And I think it's helpful, especially if the landlord's being more reasonable. And I've seen the complete spectrum here where landlords have fully understood tenants' positions and have given tenants uh, much more beneficial terms than what's in the statute. And I've seen landlords just do what's required by statute because they're probably intentionally just trying to plow through and in some way or shape or form get the tenant to agree or move towards an eviction case. Um, so there's nothing stopping the parties from negotiating further, but I don't think the landlord's required to negotiate terms that are any better for the tenant, even if the terms under the statute and what's required by statute is still up for debate by both sides. And I've seen it till this day. We're arguing about it every day as to what the statute actually requires. Um, so 
they can continue to negotiate and I think it's smart for them to do so. And I think the smart landlords have done so and, and already made agreements with tenants about something that actually works for the tenants. I wouldn't tell a tenant to necessarily agree to a payment plan that they know they're going to default on. And so I fight hard, to try to get a payment plan that actually would work for them. Um, but that may not be what's being offered by the landlord. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dan. Let's see. Okay. We have had a lot of questions come in. Okay. So kind of on the same topic or the same bucket. Mm -hmm. How much are you seeing landlords incorporate some level of rent abatement into payment plans or negotiations? And for those who are not aware, rent abatement is forgiveness. So, for example, you know, a payment plan or a deferral of rent is, you know, we will only charge you $500 a month for your rent for six months. But you will have to pay, you know, if your normal rent is a thousand dollars, the extra five hundred dollars later. That's deferral. Abatement means that additional rent goes away. Maybe last, you know, they forgive six months worth of unpaid rent. Um, so for those that don't know what abatement is, it's just forgiveness going away. Got it. Yeah, great, great description. Um, yeah, as far as abatement, I've seen everything i've seen some landlords say absolutely no abatement i've seen landlords agree to abate a significant amount especially when they realize you know the tenant uh, perhaps it was non-operational or minimally operational for long periods of time perhaps for a year um and they know maybe the tenant's uh rent was all they could afford um even in the good times. so how could they actually expect them to pay more than that moving forward uh, so I've seen I've seen landlords abate rent. I've seen landlords refuse to abate any rent. It there's nothing legally requiring them to abate rent except appealing to their common sense and you know what what's in their long term interest. I.e., um, if you're if you're going to require payments that the tenant can't afford, then eventually um, you may not have a tenant here. Isn't it better to forgive what's been Owed in the past, and we start a new pay rent moving forward, which kind of can't afford now that they're back fully open. Um, and, but again, nothing requiring them to do so, but I, I've seen it all. So some have done it, some haven't. There's really no clear approach in any form. Going back to some of the commercial lease things that are not related to the pandemic and lots of stuff that we would deal with that you would chat with folks about before all of this, mm -hmm. um, the condition of buildings and commercial spaces. Mm -hmm. If a tenant you know, takes possession of the property and they realize that, you know, maybe the wiring isn't up to code or mm -hmm. You know, there's not the proper type of sprinkler system to operate the very specific classification of business that they want to. Yeah. Is that the responsibility of the landlord, the tenant, or does it depend? It depends. It typically in uh, a provision of the lease entitled maintenance and repair or something along those lines, um, or if it relates to how the premises is delivered it may be in a separate section but um it it all depends i've seen landlords be responsible for uh any and all the things you just described i've seen provisions specifically with the landlords are responsible for none of it they're not responsible if the tenant has the entire building landlords not responsible for anything not for the roof not for the structure um and so it, it really just depends on the specific uh the specific lease terms that you have So that is going to be something that you'll want to chat one on one with a lawyer about so that they can look at your lease. It depends. The most common favorite or unfavorite lawyerly answer. Yeah. Uh, Christine, do you want to briefly go to the next slide just to talk about 
um, legal help, and then we can take more questions after yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, the DC Bar Pro Bono Center has free brief legal advice and information. Our resource website that hosts all of our past materials, upcoming events, links to sign up for things, including a COVID-19 resource hub, is lawhelp.org slash DC slash NPSB. Don't worry about writing that down. You'll get a copy of these slides sent to you. It's hyperlinked. If you want to chat one on one with a lawyer about your business, about your commercial lease, we do that about once a week. You can sign up at pro bono.center slash remote small biz clinic. Note that this is brief legal advice. You'll be chatting with an attorney for up to 60 minutes. They'll give you advice based on the information you provide, the documents, your lease, but they won't be representing you in court. They won't be drafting documents for you. They won't be negotiating with your landlord for you. If you have questions about that, you can reach out to us at npsb at dcbar.org. You may need to hire an attorney. Either, you know, pro bono center just isn't the right fit for you. You need help immediately or you chat with us and then realize, okay, uh, the volunteer attorney told me I need to take these steps, but I need a lawyer to help me with that. DC DCrefers.org is a directory of attorneys in DC that are willing to represent eligible clients of modest means, including businesses at below the market rate. There's no guarantee. It is just a directory and it is a resource. You also may need to look at a market rate attorney. And what market rate means really can depend. Um, however, there are some ways to find it. You know, word of mouth. Do you know other small business owners that have had issues with their leases? Right, that's what we're talking about here. So with commercial real estate, have they worked with an attorney? Who was it? What was their experience like? Also looking online, you know, seeing, okay, this is an attorney, they have really good reviews. It looks like they have a lot of commercial real estate experience. They're not a patent attorney that does one commercial real estate case. You know, they have some experience. They wanna check that they're licensed to practice in DC. You wanna look them up on the DC bar website to check their disciplinary history, right? You want to know who these lawyers are. And once you chat with the attorney, you want to think about, can your business afford that attorney's rate? Because all small businesses are really struggling right now, right? You can't afford your rent. But you don't want to be in a position where you hire an attorney that you really want, you really like, but their rate is, you know, $600 an hour, and there's no way your business can afford that, but you bring them on, you sign a retainer, and maybe they help you a little or a lot, you know, with your rent and negotiating with your landlord, but then you still owe, you know, $50,000 in rent over the next year and money to this attorney that was more expensive than your business could afford. So just take these things into consideration. You're going to maybe need to hire an attorney, but think think, think about, you know, all of these things, because you want somebody that can help you, that is legitimate, but also, you know, you don't want to end up with an unpaid bill to an attorney that you may never be able to pay back. Hey, Christine, one other thing I'll add on that is that since we're talking about uh, evictions, basically, landlord tenant court and the attorneys that appear there it's kind of its own atmosphere and so there's you know specific attorneys with experience um within that specific court and so you could have there could be attorneys that you know maybe they do commercial leases for example negotiating them but they don't represent uh tenants in commercial uh landlord tenant court and so just Something to keep in mind when you're if you're thinking about a division specifically, 
that um, there's typically specific lawyers and firms that deal with with that court itself. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Is it the attorney a litigator? Do they go to court? Do they represent clients there? Or do they just you know, help with the negotiations and the paperwork in the background? Right. Um, okay. Do we have any other questions? Let's see. Okay. Are commercial tenants permitted to stay after their lease term expires? So, oh, and here's there's some additional details. So maybe their lease will expire in January 2022, mm -hmm. but the notice period for their renewal has already passed. Mm -hmm. Are they legally allowed to stay? Okay. <laughs> um, Which this could this could be more broadly applicable. Right. Um, no, that's that's fairly a broadly applicable situation. So, um, whether or not you have properly exercised your option to renew uh, the lease um, is a specific situation, and so I can't really speak to that, but in the situation where you have failed to properly exercise your renewal option and your lease expires in January 2022, for example, what happens if you overstay then? Um, you typically leases deal with this by stating that you, you're holding over and typically leases will say something like, if you hold over, you you owe rent for that period of time that you hold over, either double or maybe 1.5 times your rent. Um, but that doesn't change the process that the landlord has to go through to evict you. So if you overstay your lease term and let's say it goes through the end of January 2022, so it's February 1st, 2022, and you're still there, then the landlord may, depending on what the lease says, be able to begin the process of trying to start an eviction case, but they still have to get an eviction case in that situation. It doesn't change um, the situation versus non-payment of rent. And I think that we are going to try to Take phone questions. Wonderful. This is Kate at DSLBD, and I will assist with that. If you are a call in user, um, we are going to unmute some of your lines. If there is a lot of background noise, we might remute you. Um, if you do, um, if you could put your phone on mute on your side, that will be helpful. We're going to start with the um, phone numbers that have the 202 area codes. There are several of those. Um, so we're going to go ahead and unmute you now in case you have a question, and we'll pause for a few moments. You're receiving a request to unmute for the 202 numbers. Do any of our 202 call-in users have a question? I see someone has unmuted. Um, I think your last digits are 33. Please go ahead. Yes, I have a question. So does the, the small business apply to sole I'm sorry, can you, you repeat that? When you said LLC um, corporation, is the same with sole proprietor? Uh, is it so the business is under your name? Yes. Um, so, yeah, that was in response to whether or not you could represent yourself. And so, yes, I think you can represent yourself in court if you wanted to. I still wouldn't recommend it, but as far as the. Oh, no. I or that some of the things that you were saying pertaining to businesses was the same as sole Yeah, if you're a sole proprietorship that has a, a commercial business um, and you qualify as either a commercial tenant or uh, under 6,500 square feet or a commercial retail tenant, then yes, you, you're you protected by those things. Okay, thank you. Another thing is if you've spoken to your landlord and they never gave you a payment plan, we were just paying what we could, but still was, it seems as 
if they made up their own, you know, plan for us, uh, just by lowering the rent that we still couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. um, is that that's still not? But there was nothing ever written. Yeah, that <laughs> that's not an uncommon situation. And what I'll say is, if it's it, the landlords required to pro propose a payment plan in writing. So if they haven't done that, they haven't complied with the statute. Um, as far as situations where, and that's a very specific set of circumstances that will depend on exactly how um, the communications went between the parties. Um, so I, I can't really speak to exactly what's happened there, but in general, if it hasn't been reduced to writing, arguably the landlord hasn't actually changed the lease and they may still be able to have their rights reserved as to that rent that they haven't collected yet. And so that's why if you think that the landlord is reducing your rent for a period of time and not going to ask for it, you, I would recommend getting it in writing because if you don't, um, the landlord arguably, depending on the facts, could try to argue later that they could still seek it. Okay. And if we were already on our lease has been expired, we're just on month to month. Um, do the same um, commercial tenant, you know, eviction rules apply? Yes, we, we talked about that a second ago. Um, going through the eviction process is the same process. Okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see from 202, we have a call in user with the last two digits, 32, who's unmuted? If you'd like to ask your question. Could you repeat that? Oh, for our call in user who's um, 202 area code, last two digits, 32, if you'd like to ask your question. I have a 33. Three. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Christopher. Uh, two questions. One is I'm currently on a month to month lease in a rental property that my family business has been renting for 53 years. And my, I believe you gave the address, the website address of DC refers for possible attorneys. Uh, a, a question. I had was regarding my lease. If I'm on a month to month, it's not like the the landlord, which is a new landlord after 48 years, they took over a couple of years ago. It's not like they're agitating to leave us or to have us leave, but the situation is we have to close. And so possibly my lease has, even though it's month to month, is on a 120 day clause. So I have to give notice. Number The question number one is, if I give notice July 1st that I'm going to leave in 120 days, or I potentially could leave in 120 days, can the landlord say, okay, let us know when you want to leave, or the day after that 120 days say, okay, now you have 30 days, you have to leave. Um, and that forces our hand to be out in 120 plus 30 days. And it's difficult to leave a 53-year-old business in 120 days, let alone 150 days. Um, so does a 120 day clause in any type of lease that I have, any type of estoppel when this new owner took over, does that require, does that protect me in some ways that if I give 120 days notice, I have to leave in 120 days or can I give a notice saying I may want to leave in 120 days unless something works out, in which case I have to get potentially a lawyer to negotiate with this landlord. Second question is that there's, it's a two-story building. The upstairs tenant vacated. Can I, can I stop you there? Oh, uh, sure. Um, is, is this second question also extremely specific? Uh, I'm sorry? Is this other question also specific to your situation? Uh, not so much specific to my situation. It's more of a Washington gas utilities question that might apply to other people. Um, all right, go ahead. The uh, there's two tenants. We were on the first floor. There was a tenant on the second floor. The specificity is that the second floor tenant for years would get the Washington gas bill, and and we'd pay, pay them back. Uh, they vacated. the The second floor tenant vacated. I was out of town, and I 
found out that Washington, they, they, for continuity of service, I had to have Washington Gas put into my business's name. I find out there's a bill that says there's a $700 connection fee. Is that something, even though the gas was never shut off and I didn't reconnect anything, it was just continuity of service, the landlord must have known that the upstairs tenant was vacating. So why they didn't take over any utility, I'm not sure, in the, in, the, in the Washington gas. But if I have a bill, if my business technically has a bill or, for, or a business has a bill that says, well, there's a connection charge of $700, is that incumbent upon me to have to call Washington gas and say, look, this is a situation, or is it up to me to technically or up to a business to call the landlord and say, hey, you let the va you let the the second floor tenant who was accepting the Washington Gas bill to begin with, and we were splitting with them. You have to work it out with Washington Gas. Here's the seven hundred dollar bill if it's not connection. Is that something that I then uh, have to work with the landlord to say, hey, why is the gas coming to me when you should be taking over the gas bill? It's your it's your property. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Uh huh. That is going to depend on the words of your lease. So that's sure. something that you're going to need to chat one on one with a lawyer about so they can look at the exact wording mm -hmm. um, and kind of help you figure out the situation and how you can move forward. Mm -hmm. So if you want, you can reach out to us at the DC Bar Pro Bono Center and we can get you scheduled to chat with a volunteer attorney um, and look at a copy of the lease. And that was the uh, DC. Uh, you 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 said it before. The uh, b b b b b the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. DC Bar Pro Bono Center. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, this is Kate jumping in again, real quick, and and I think um, I think I know who's speaking right now, so we can make sure that we get you the referral information. We do want to make sure we have just a couple minutes left. Um, and we have a few people on the phone who do not have two two area codes. Um, if you want to speak, we're also sending you um, a request to unmute. Just please um, try to keep your question brief and, and let everyone know that we will be sending out information for how you can reach out to the pro bono center after this if your question was not answered. Any other call in users who'd like to ask a question? Okay, um, we are not seeing anyone else unmuting. Um, so I definitely want to say a very big thank you to um, to Dan Kaufman and to Christine Kulumani uh, for all of the um, work that you do all of the time to support DC businesses for this incredibly helpful presentation. Um, and you know, I'll just say back: Is there any any closing remarks that either of you would like to make? I would just say, don't be concerned or worried about reaching out to the pro bono center or to an attorney. Um, you know, engaging a lawyer can be scary, but it doesn't have to be, especially pro bono. You can just have one conversation. It doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to get you geared up to battle with your landlord, which is sometimes how folks envision it. It's just a conversation to help you understand your rights and how you can move forward. So please. Feel comfortable, feel safe reaching out, even if you think, okay, right now I'm protected from eviction. Start thinking about the next steps, and we are happy to talk through My you know, the protections with you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, and, and thank you both to Christine and to Dan, and we're gonna go ahead and stop that recording. Um, and we will be sending out these materials and the recording to everyone who is registered for this session, as well as making this available on DSLBD's YouTube. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Christine. I think if there is someone from my team who has the host role, if you could stop the recording.